Hey ladies, welcome to Black Women Making Money on this beautiful Sunday that we're having here in the Maryland area. I want to say hello to everybody. We are going to put our clock on for 60 seconds, give people a chance to come in, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Rich BFF, Becoming Rich AF, and the Rich Girl Lifestyle from the Black Woman's Point of View. Here is the 90 second clock. <laughs> Welcome to Black Women Making Money. We are the home of the upwardly mobile Black woman. For exclusive content and invitations to our inner circle Zoom meetings, which happen on a monthly basis, you can sign up for free for our email newsletter at bwmakingmoney.com. That's bwmakingmoney.com. Hey, ladies, who wants to become rich AF? Uh, well, if you are tuning into Black Women Making Money, of course, you are always in the right place. We are super excited to have uh, our discussion this evening coming up this evening at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. We are going to have our Rich AF discussion. And honestly, I am thinking about making this a multi-month discussion. Today, we're going to review a couple of interviews that Vivian did, but I'm also thinking about us getting her book and actually doing a book club. So uh, if you're listening to the replay, let me know what you think about that. If you are watching live, let me know what you think about us actually doing a book club around Rich AF and putting the lessons that Vivian and so many others have put uh, have discussed with us. So I know a lot of my younger millennials like Vivian's content, like the idea of Rich AF, and we're going to have that discussion this evening. So I did want to kind of come and lay some of the groundwork with regards to the Rich AF lifestyle from a Black point of view. A couple of days ago, I had the discussion with you about DEI's days are numbered, and that's not just coming from me. A lot of court cases are happening with regards to DEI. Um, I know that some of you uh, in the comments have been very vocal about this is a new Jim Crow. Uh, they're not going after other ethnic groups. They're just coming after us. I am here to say none of that matters. From your point of view, individually, your point of view, you want to have your technical skills, your soft skills, your resources, and your multicultural networks. And the truth is Vivian's, um, now I don't watch a lot of her short content. I've just uh, 
you know, she's always in my feed with regards to YouTube pushing her. So I was aware of who she was, uh, but I've been watching a few of her interviews and she's really talked about the fact that she has had all of those things. If you all really catch the um, lessons and the discussions that she's having with regards to her interviews. So I think this is super interesting. I think that she is an interesting young lady. Obviously, she is not the first person to talk about these different tips uh, with regards to getting your money right, things like that. But she definitely is engaging. She's entertaining. And, you know, we can have the rich BFF lifestyle. So I think that that's uh, something that's really cool, something for us to really consider. So what I want to do is I want to play the beginning of an interview she did with a, a gentleman named Eric Sue. We're going to have more conversations about this. And again, this evening at 6 p.m. Eastern time is when we're going to have the full discussion about her rich AF lifestyle. But I want to make sure you all know that we are doing that um, discussion tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern time. If you want to get the Zoom link, you got to be on my email list, bwmakingmoney.com. So let's pull this up here. And let's have a brief discussion about her background. And I'm going to, as she's talking, I'm going to relay certain things to you with regards to her back background, how she got to be where she is today, and how the four things I'm always telling you ladies to have, including your technical skills, soft skills, multicultural networks, and resources, plays into her background and her story. So let's hear it. Ask. And it's hard. How rich do you want to be? What would be ideal? Because I think you made a comment about how billionaires shouldn't exist, right? So like, yeah. what, what does that cap out at? So I think this ties back to like my FU number. I think I have multiple tiers of FU number. I think the FU number in my head right now, as it stands, is 25 million. Because at 25 million invested, that backs into about a million a year if I'm able to get a 4% return on that 25 mil, which is very conservative. Got it. And at a mil a year, I can do everything that I want in my life. I have my, you know, primary home. I have a vacation home. I'm going to be able to help put my kids through any sort of education they want to do, any sort of vacations our family wants to have. We'll be able to afford a car. It's going to cover every expense that I need. I wouldn't have to work anymore. And at that point, I would say that my priorities would severely change based on the fact that my financial needs and my family's future financial needs, not just my own, but my family's future financial needs would all be met. Mark my words. Okay. So the first thing is the FU number that she has. My question to you is, do you have your FU number? Um, I, through being a loan officer, most of you know that I am a loan officer, through being a loan officer, I... Uh, had to do this exercise called the Freedom Exercise a few weeks ago, and my FU number is two million. And they basically laid out for me an eight-year plan to get to that. With regards to uh, again for me because of this hype of of company that I have, um, they even laid out how many leads I need to have, how many loans I need to do, how much income I need to make because I make money based on the loans that I help. Um, originate is what it's called, et cetera. For you, one of the things that Vivian talks about is number one, knowing your FU number, but then number two, figuring out how you're going to get there because the budgeting and the financial path for me to get to my FU number is different from you getting to your FU number. Also understanding, not just thinking about today, today, what is your FU number, but 20 years from now, let's say that you pay off your house, you uh, pay off your credit card, you continue to live 20, 30, 40 years from now, is that number still going to be a number that you can live with? Because today, my FU number may be, hey, I need to bring in enough um, for $50,000 a year, base expenses. However, am I still going to be happy with that 
five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. So we want to think about that. We want to think about how we actually get into the thought process of what is our individual FU number and how we're going to get there. So I didn't mean to show this first, um, but I I did, uh, which is okay. It was something I was going to show anyway. I want to go back to her origin story, though, because I think her origin story is pretty interesting. And I'm going to come here to um, this tab here. So move this a little bit further. Okay, so this is another interview that she did. Um, and I want us to hear her origin story and I'm going to chime in with regard to some of the thoughts I have as she is talking. Let me just make sure I have this on normal speed and here we go. No, she did her homework guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so why don't you start by telling us your story? I guess for listeners who don't know much about you, what is your story from your background working on Wall Street to starting you know, your TikTok and everything? Yeah, so I was, I am the daughter of two Chinese immigrants. I grew up in the suburbs of Maryland and for my family, and I'm sure so many, you know, Asian immigrant children, education was always talked about as the end all be all. This is your way to have social and economic mobility. So I was a very good student, big nerd, and I ended up getting into the University of Chicago. All right. So I want to talk about this first of all. Education, education, education. There are two types of education that we want to have. We want to have our technical skills and we want to have our soft skills. Technical skills and soft skills. In our families, for the most part, if you're an upwardly mobile Black woman, for the most part, you also grew up in a household that really focused on education. I know my household definitely really focused on education. So um, the splinter between the Black community and the Asian community, when it comes to us as upwardly mobile Black women, I don't think that there's that much of a difference. Okay. I don't think that there's that much of a difference. So let's keep listening. And there it is known for being like an economics focused school. A lot of the student body ends up going to get jobs on Wall Street. Okay. So within this discussion here, this is really funny. I've, I've been re-listening or listening to, again, people saying, hey, you know, Black people shouldn't be going to college, Black people shouldn't be going to college, et cetera, et cetera. And I've said to you before that it's not necessarily the college, it's not necessarily the degree, it's the lack of skills that you have when you come out and it's the lack of networks. She went to a specific skill that would get her into a specific job and a specific um um, what do you call it? Industry, which was Wall Street. And then she determined, determined after a couple of years, she didn't like it, but there's a specific reason why she ended up not liking it. Um, but when we go to college, when we are mapping out our paths, even beyond college, we do want to think about who are we surrounding ourselves with and what is that group known for? Um, I think enough of us are not strategic in that. We have so many people online just telling Black women, Black people, don't go to college. It's a scam. It's a waste of time. Get you a trade and just you know get a job that way. How is that a real 10-year plan, 20-year plan for you? And if you discover in your 40s that in order for you to move up the corporate ladder, you need a bachelor's degree, but you didn't get one when you were 18, 19, 20, 21, and now you've got three kids, then what? Then what? And enough enough of us are not having that conversation. So um, let's continue listening to this as she's sharing her origin story. Um, all the major banks and private equity firms and hedge funds actually come to campus to recruit just because they know there's such a desire and interest. 
And I started my first job as a trader at JP Morgan. And it was very interesting in that my very first day there, it was abundantly clear to me that there weren't many other Asian people and there weren't many other women. And by that, I mean, every single person was a white guy. And my mentor was the only other person of color, only other woman. And she also happened to be um, an Asian woman. Okay. So I thought that this was very interesting. And first of all, salute to Alonso. Glad to have you here. So I thought that this part of her story was very interesting that she walks in, she is um, one of two uh, women. They're both Asian women. It just so happens that the woman that she's referring to is ends up being her boss uh, as well, which is helpful. But then everybody else is a white male. I'm here to say, I don't care personally. If, if I get a job and they're all white people there, I don't. I don't care. And I think that too many of us are too focused on seeing other people like us instead of figuring out what can I learn from this environment? What can I take from this environment? Unless they are hostile to you, who cares? Who cares? Because she actually talks as well about there's not a lot of Asian people in, you know, on Wall Street, et cetera. Who cares? Who cares, right? Are you there? Are they treating you with respect? What can you learn from that? Can you do something with that? She talks about the fact that there would be people there that would treat the entire desk to lunch her, or her department to lunch, $1,500 lunches. And she would just be amazed at that. That's what you need to learn. Not I walk in and I don't see another black woman there for And I'm here to say that, that it's nice if you see another Black woman, but just, just because she's a Black woman doesn't mean she's on your side. We've had this conversation. So um, Alonzo is saying, just left a group of newbies from Merrill Lynch at Fogo de Chao. I like them. I recruited them. You recruited them. Yeah, look, you bringing people over to you. Good for you, Alonzo. Self-care is here saying good morning, everyone. I think it all depends on what career path path you are. Not all careers require a four-year bachelor's degree. It's true. So not all careers require a bachelor's degree. It also depends on what you are looking to do. I just want people to have a long-term 20-year look at what they're trying to do and not just think, as long as I could get into this career, you know, without a bachelor's degree, that's it. If you get into a career or into a job with just a cert certification and they are paying for you at that point to go to college, I'm just suggesting before Black women get saddled with children and hopefully a husband with it, husband and children, to get your degree. Have it in your back pocket just in case, because it's harder to go back as a 40 year old black woman, you know, than it is for you to get it early on. That's the only thing I'm trying to say with that. It's the only thing. And I've really thought about it a lot of different ways. Also, right now, we've had this conversation on this channel about the white collar jobs and the new collar jobs, the new collar jobs are these certifications. You take them for six months, you're able to get your first job, et cetera. I'm telling you, the new collar jobs, it seems like it's the way to, you know, um, to increase your income, which it is, right? But ultimately, I think it's going to be the mark of either the working poor or um, middle class, in order to get to upper middle class, either you're going to be in sales, you're going to be a business owner, a true business owner, not side hustle and all of that. Um, or in corporate, if you're talking about moving to upper management, most likely having a degree is going to help. If we're looking to, the, you know, this is 2024, if we're looking at the year 2044, and we're going to look at the percentage of Black people who have college degrees versus don't. The percentage of white people who have college degrees versus don't. And the ones who are running industries. 
That's all I'm saying. So, um, and it's okay for people not to agree with me. It's just, that's just, I'm just asking us to think chestnut checkers and think four, five, six moves out. So, um, but let's keep listening to Vivian's origin story here. So she took me under her wing. I feel so grateful. She teaches me everything I know and everything's gravy for the first year and a half. But as it happens on Wall Street, there was a shakeup and the head of my desk got let go. The new head of the desk came in, fired pretty much 50% of the team overnight, brought in his own people. And it just became a really different environment. And my new manager was unsupportive at best. He would make comments about, you know, you're too girly to be here or you know, he didn't like how my nails click clacked on the keyboard. And he, he just would make very inappropriate comments. And then one day in particular, I came to work with a long cardigan on and he touched his hands together and bowed at me and said, Ooh, is that a kimono? (laughs) And I say this to you, Eileen, because I feel like you and I probably have an unspoken understanding almost of like what it's like to be spoken to that way. Okay, so the reason she's saying this specific story is because she is Chinese and not Japanese. She she was born of and raised by Chinese immigrants, not Japanese. So this guy coming to her, you know, bowing his head, kimono, um, all Asian people look alike is probably what she's thinking. Same thing we have as black women, right? We can talk about the tropes and the things. The other reason why I wanted to share this story, and we're gonna talk about it a lot more um, this evening uh, at 6 p.m. when we have our Zoom session, is you may enter a company and really like the environment, really like your boss, and then all of a sudden, the company is bought by another company. You have a merger, um, your old boss leaves and a new boss comes in, et cetera. How do you navigate those things? How do you navigate those things? I still believe you cannot navigate those things without my four famous four, technical skills, soft skills, multicultural networks and resources. You got to have all four if you need to pivot, if you need to leave, et cetera. How many of us are, you know, doing a thing for a year and a half? We think things are great. We're not uh, increasing our networks. We're not building up our war chests, building up our resources, et cetera. Things change on a dime. You're not laid off or anything like that. The environment just becomes toxic. Then what? So I'm always talking with you about how you can navigate and prepare. And I try to give you like real advice with regards to networking. Um, Tam and uh, Victoria from Credit Solutionist and I talked in the mental health discussion about networking. Tam said some things and then I gave you like practical advice. Here's how you apply this when networking. And then Tam talked a little bit more and Victoria talked a little bit more with like practical networking advice. So at some point I'm going to split that out and just have that session for everybody to go and listen to. But you need practical advice with regards to your technical skills. You need practical advice with regards to your soft skills and how to build those up. You need practical advice with regards to building a multicultural network, and you need practical advice with regards to building your resources, your war chest, et cetera. So um, what are you all saying here? You're saying, honestly, I think the goal of every woman should be to become a business owner. Corporate America was not designed for women. I used to think that. I know a lot of people say that. I am not certain that entrepreneurship is for everybody. In fact, entrepreneurship, so I've been an entrepreneur, I've been full-time entrepreneur since 2008. If you do not have the lifestyle or the stomach for your revenues going up and down, um, you know, if if, if you need to have a paycheck 
coming into your account every other Friday, then entrepreneurship is not for you. So while I hear what you're saying, I don't necessarily believe that that is the case. Now, do I think that every woman should and could have a not side hustle, because we don't do side hustles over here, side business? Yes. Yes. So some women, I say, yeah, absolutely. You should be on, you know, entrepreneurship track. Some women, I say, you should have a sales job. That way you can have a base income and then you can have commissions on top of that. Some women do need to be in corporate America. And corporate America doesn't necessarily mean your Fortune 500 conglomerate. It could be a small business with 30, 40, 50 employees. That's a very family, family focused um, environment, you know, but you get your paycheck every other week without fail. So we can again have that discussion. Um, in fact, I'd love to have that discussion, you know, on YouTube at some point, because I don't, I don't think that entrepreneurship is for everybody. I don't. A side business can be for everybody. If you have your, if you're the type that has to have a check come in every, you know, every two weeks without fail so you can make your mortgage payment, your kids, you know, your single mom, et cetera, great. You have that. And then you could have a side business that brings in two to $5,000 a month. And that side business becomes your war chest. It becomes your, if this, corporate job isn't working, then I can pivot to this thing. It'll keep me afloat while I find the next thing, etc. I'm with you there. But no. um, Nia is here saying, even if she were Japanese, will still be gross. I agree with you there. I agree with you there. It wasn't cold. Um, and you're saying here, self-care saying, trust me, I've had I was head of HR for 10 years behind closed doors. These companies, male presidents, and vice presidents say a lot of misogynistic things about women. I, I Trust me, I definitely believe that. Definitely believe that. They're going to say things about you and I. They're going to say things about her. They're going to say things about white women, you know? So um, I've had heads of companies not hire women because they are married, have children, or are overweight. Yeah, Pe people will not hire you for all sorts of reasons. This is why you need to have a multicultural network you need to have people on speed dial that can get you not only the interviews, but get you the positions that you need in order to, um, to make money and feed your family. But guess what? Overweight women are hired every day. I'm an overweight woman. I was hired last year. You know, I'm 47. I was hired last year. So you can do that. But I was hired because of my network, right? And because I have a certain skill set that this this gentleman wanted and needed. So, all right, let's keep listening to this. And that's really unfortunate. But I knew I had to go. I couldn't stay there. That guy was never going to support me or my career or make sure that I had what I needed to succeed and excel. So I spoke to my very first mentor, my manager, and she ended up getting me an interview with one of her girlfriends who was now a team lead at BuzzFeed. Okay, on so Vivian had a mentor. It was a woman who worked at, at I think it was JP Morgan, wherever she was working previously, that woman left. But that woman, she it seems like she stayed in touch with that woman. That woman was her mentor. Mentor equals networks. Now, they just so happen to be, both of them, I believe, just so happen to be Chinese women. So that helped. Um, but even if it's not, you know, if, if you don't have another Black woman, that's fine. Find somebody else. The person could be a male. They could be Indian. They could be, you know, uh, Chinese, they, whatever. Build your multicultural network. So because of her network, because of her education, the skills that she had and her network, when the environment that she was in turned toxic, she was able to get another job. She was able to get another job. And when I heard that, I'm like, all, all the things I've been talking about, 
in her origin story, in the Rich BFF origin story, all of these things are being proven out. Okay, let's keep listening. The strategy sales department. And I met with this new woman and she really took a liking to me. I went through the interview process, met with everyone else on the team and ended up getting the job. And I didn't know anything about tech. I didn't know anything about media. I didn't know anything about advertising or marketing or any of the things that I was supposedly going to do. But I just said, you know, I'll figure it out. And so because of a strong network, she didn't know anything about the job that she was going to do, but they hired her anyway. I will tell you, I am somebody who was hired not knowing anything about the job that I was going to do. Not this specific job that I had, but a job that I had when I was about 25, 26. I was grossly unprepared for that job. But I said to that woman, if you give me a chance, I will knock it out the park for you. You tell me what you need me to know. I will figure out what to what to study. I will take whatever classes need to be taken. And I did that. And within six months, I became her star employee. So ladies, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to go for jobs that you are underqualified for, or not qualified for. But it's helpful if you go for those jobs with the recommendation of somebody in your network that could say, no, no, lady and mob. She she's really good and she will pick up on what needs to be, you know, what skills she needs in order to do this job really, really well. What happens typically with black people and black women in, in, in particular is we hear, oh, white men, they apply for jobs that they don't qualify for. They apply for jobs they don't qualify for. And we try to do that ourselves just doing that. Can we get a job we don't qualify for um, just, you know, if we send out a thousand resumes and we get one? Yes, absolutely. But oftentimes they're applying for jobs that they don't qualify for, but they also have some sort of a competitive edge as well. So the job that I got that I wasn't qualified for, a headhunter got me the interview and the headhunter said, Sheree is really smart. If you give her this job, she is going to perform. What I'm asking you is who on your team, who in your network has the kind of pull and juice can make a call and make that happen for you? We need multicultural networks in order to be able to level up financially, in order to become rich AF. And there are so many examples that, um, and Vivian's story that she talks about that just proves how much we need technical skills, soft skills, multicultural networks, and resources. Her parents had the resources to get her into a top school and pay the school with cash so that she didn't have any student debt. We gotta have all of these things, right? Um, so Lady Amav, thank you for being here. Uh, Self-care is saying not in fashion or entertainment industry. I'm not sure about, oh, you must be talking about the overweight. Well, yeah, I mean, unless you're talking about behind the scenes, um, and there's no way you're 47. Oh, thank you. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, I worked as HR fashion labels, cosmetic companies, and entertainment studios. Okay. All right. Uh, and hello, unknown. Hello, hello. And um, Vivian obviously is not here. She's not going to be here at six. Uh, we're just going to watch a couple of her videos and talk about it from our point of view. So I don't want people to think they're going to come in and, and meet the rich BFF, but we're going to have the conversation from her point of view. So, or from our point of view, sorry. Uh, let's keep listening. And when I got there, uh, I ended up becoming one of the top sellers within two years. And during that time, all of my new colleagues basically said, Hey, you're from wall street. Like, can you help us rebalance our 401k? Help us pick a right healthcare plan. Help us, you know, select investments. Should we be investing in the company stock options? What does any of this mean? And I started creating videos for them, not for <laughs> like your reason. coworkers and people at BuzzFeed. 
Yeah. Oh. Uh, the person who encouraged me to start Your Rich BFF was actually just, you know, the girl that I joked around was like my work wife. Like she was my oh. best friend at work. And she is the reason why I had the guts to do it because she kept pressuring me. And so I, uh, I, I started January 1st of 2021, made a video. And by the end of the week, that video had gone viral and I had over a hundred thousand followers. Um, yeah. So that is Vivian's origin story. And she's talked about it on, on multiple podcasts. I've listened to about five or six podcasts with her on it. So I've, I, um, I thought that, that her origin story was great. She, I, I really wanted us to hone in on the fact that number one, you know, she went into a male dominated industry. Um, she and one other woman were the only two uh, women in her department. They just so happen to both be Chinese women as well. You know, uh, lo and behold, the Chinese woman left. They had a shake up in management and the new manager didn't like her. And not only that, Vivian knew that the new manager would not advocate for her would not be a great, um, uh, it wouldn't be great for her to continue in that path, in that career. So she went back to the mentor and she got into a company with skill uh, that required skills that she didn't have, but she learned them over the course of two years. She became one of the top salespeople. Um, so, you know, these things happen. You got, you got to, um, you got to have, though, your multicultural networks. You got to have your multicultural networks. And with DEI, DEI's numbers being, DEI's days being numbered, we have this conversation on Friday. You know, if people look at you, they, they used to say, oh, double minority, black and woman, check. I'm trying to tell you in the next five years, it's going to be a big X against us. I know you all don't want to hear it, or some people don't want to hear it, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Companies are going to start getting sued. Why did you hire that person? Why did you hire that person and you didn't hire me? It started with colleges. Now the Minority Business Development Agency, the Fearless Fund is getting sued. So you have to have proven top 10% of your skills with regards to technical skills. You've got to have your soft skills, got to have your multicultural networks, and you have to have the resources to weather the storm. You do. And then we're able to take the money that we're making. So the first investment that I always think we want to make is in our skills. Can you get a skill that can make you 125000 130000 plus per year. That's number one. And you also want to make sure that you are financially literate enough where you are able to, um, you know, save some money, not overspend, things like that, right? And then from there, we want to get in the rooms, we want to get around the people that can introduce us not only to, you know, just investing period, the basic rules of investing, but other opportunities as well. And when we do that, when we do that, we can become rich AF, just like Vivian is talking about. So um, self-care is saying, and yes, your look and image got you hired and are promoted for behind the scenes positions. This was often more important than your actual skills and knowledge of the job. Okay. Interesting. So is there a, so I, so in the fashion and entertainment industry, totally different industries, I'm not going to fight you on that. Were there base level skills? Were there base level skills? I'm going to also bring up another story as well with regards to entertainment. And this isn't everybody in entertainment. This is just, you know. I was watching an old Whitney Houston interview, and she talked about Martha Wash. If you're familiar with Martha Wash, she was a, a dance 
she was a singer that did like a lot of dance songs. And one of the songs that she did was uh, Everybody Dance Now by CNC Music Factory. And she had a powerhouse voice. Let me see if I can. Oh no, self care if you know who Martha Wash is. But this was her. This was Martha Wash. Here. She was the powerhouse. She did a song. Oops, let me actually put it up here. Sorry. This is Martha, Martha Wash here. This is Martha Wash. She was a powerhouse singer. She did um, Everybody Dance Now. You know, that was her one of her big songs, but she had other songs as well. Um, there are skills even within the entertainment industry, whether it's accounting, whether it is... Um, uh, a and R, for example, et cetera. And again, you know more about your industry than I do, but there has to be somebody in those industries that are competent. There has to be somebody in those industries that are competent. Now, the controversy with Martha Wash is she sang Everybody Dance Now, and then they put a little skinny woman to lip sync in the music video. Yes, absolutely. But do I, would I honestly believe that everybody behind the scenes, it care, they, um, it's more important how you look than being competent? Everybody behind the scenes? No. No, I, I don't know. I, I would need to do some more research about that. But, and this is very interesting. You're saying this well, for the companies I recruited and hired for candidates needed to have at least a bachelor's degree. This is why I'm thinking 20 years down the road right now, it's not needed. A bachelor's degree is not needed in order to get a job and in order to move up and uh, up the corporate ladder or, or get opportunities. My concern is 20 years down the road. It's 2024 now by 2044, Will having a college degree be necessary again? And if you are 20 today, you're going to be 40 years old. You may have two kids. You may have a husband you're taking care of. You may have a mother, father you're taking care of. Right now, today, you're 20 years old and childless. Does it make more sense does it make more sense for you to just get the bachelor's degree while you are single and childless? That's all I'm saying. And I would love for us to have a greater conversation about it. We're, we're playing chestnut checkers. 30 years from now, will it make a difference? And I know some people will say, nobody ever asked me if I had a college degree. Nobody ever asked me if I had a college degree. You think they're not going on your LinkedIn and looking to see if you have one? You think they're not looking at the bottom of your resume to see if you have one? You think the applicant tracking system is not putting in, they're not putting into the, the applicant tracking system. Oh, we know how to get rid of candidates. We'll put that they need a bachelor's degree. 70% of Black people don't have a bachelor's degree. I'm just asking us to play chestnut checkers. When we say these euphemisms all the time, we say play chestnut checkers, yet so many people, if we were to ask for an example of playing chestnut checkers, they can't give you an example of it. I'm telling you, this is an example of playing chestnut checkers. If I'm talking to a black man 20, 30 years down the road, if he needs a bachelor's degree, it is easier for her, for him to go and get a bachelor's degree at that time, even if he has two kids, because most likely the kids are not going to even be living at home with him. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to have, a, a, I'm trying to expand the conversation here. So, you know, anyway, 
like I said, we'll we'll have more conversations about that at some point. Um, Torian Dreams is here. Hello, ancient soul. I don't think I've seen you before, but you're saying, yeah. Unknown is saying you'll always have more opportunities with a degree than without. Exactly. Exactly. You can also leverage your alma mater. I have a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Now, I, I do wish I hadn't gotten the master's degree, but I have it now. But I can always go back and leverage the alumni in, with, um, in my bachelor's degree, as well as the alumni in my master's degree, because I went to two different schools. You can do something with it. Ancient Soul say in 100, I regret waiting. I'm 33 with a child just finishing up my degree. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being honest. Thank you for being honest. We're going to have a conversation. I watched a very good um, TikTok compilation about people regretting college degrees. And I'm here to tell you the degree was not the issue. The degree is not the issue. The issue is people came out without real skills, real job skills, and no networks. That was the issue. The issue was not the marketing degree. The issue is you have a marketing degree, and marketing is all about generating leads for a business. And if I tell you, I have a mortgage company, I need you to generate 20 leads for me every week. And you just graduated with a marketing degree and you look at me blank, like, I don't know how to do that. That is what's useless. You don't have the technical skills of a marketing professional to help our businesses, whether they're small businesses, medium businesses, or large businesses. Your marketing degree is useless, not because you have a degree, but because you don't have the skills necessary to help me as a marketing person. The other thing you don't have as a marketing degree person is a network. You can't get to me. You can't get to me and say, Cherie, not only do I have a degree in marketing, but I can also help you get 20 leads per week for your mortgage business. I guarantee you, if you have those things, people will, will gladly say, yeah, I'll give you a chance. I'll hire you, etc." It's not the degree. It's not the degree. It's the fact that people don't know how to work in the system. And I didn't want to get... <laughs> <laughs> when you get it, but I was listening to something yesterday and I was just like, oh my gosh, this, this gentleman is, um, I'll say who it is, a sub-zero, sub-zero, I was listening to him and he was talking about how degrees are useless and how um, people should get trades. And he's specifically speaking more to black men, black men getting a trade. Now he's got his lifting the veil, um, He's got his Lifting the Veil um, Academy that teaches people how to get into tech, right? Uh, he's been on Erica's channel a lot, the Lifting the Veil, Lifting the Veil Academy. Here's the thing. It, he just tells people, get a trade, get a trade, get a trade. It is not just get a trade because two minutes later, he will talk about Lifting the Veil and he teaches people how to... Um, get past the applicant tracking system, how to get the interview, what to say in the interview, how to um, how to navigate the corporate structure so that way they're able to increase their income, all of that. That is not just getting a certification. That's getting a mentor and that is getting a network of people that can assist you in, in corporate America. And some of the things that I just want to say is when we say chestnut checkers, these are the things that we're talking about. And yes, you don't need a degree today to get into tech. However, in 20 years, you get 20 years from now and you're ready to move up into senior management. And they're like, eh, we don't know. They may make an exception for you, but they may not. Who knows? So, um, 
Self-care is saying Los Angeles is a very competitive job environment. The positions are mostly for account management, so your image was essential for these positions. I would agree with that. So my question is, resources, do you need to be in Los Angeles? Resources, can you move out of Los Angeles? Resources, you need resources to do that. Just like you need resources to be in Los Angeles. Uh, and then number two is um, your multicultural networks as well, you know? Are you bringing in some sort of technical skill that the skinny people don't have that the company absolutely needs? Now, they may shove you in a closet somewhere or they may say, you can work from home, but we absolutely need this specific skill. And this overweight woman over here, she has that skill, right? So we, aren't, we, we, we you may not be invited to the Hollywood parties and all of that, but, you know, or you have the resources to get you out, get on now. I shouldn't joke about this. Um, Ozempic seems like people are having some issues with Ozempic. So I wouldn't suggest Ozempic, but you know, if you, know, you need cosmetic surgery, any of that, you're in Los Angeles. And I have an uncle in the movie industry. So I know that LA is, is different. I, that entertainment industry is different. So, hey, Lanique, hello, hello. Unknown is saying, and it's hard for alabastrimist. I don't know what that is to say if you're not qualified, if you have a degree. <laughs> uh, does not mean you always need advanced degrees. That's true. You may not need a master's. You may not need a master's. Yeah. Uh, Ancient Soul is here as well saying, um, I'm, a, uh, oh, you're Love Rika. Okay. Just change your new to YouTube name. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember you now. Um, the trades are good, but I wouldn't have been laid off so much if I had a bachelor's degree. Yeah. So it is also easier to get a network and mentors when you have a degree, especially if you do not come from wealth. This is true. This is very, very true. So, okay, ladies. Well, that is the end of the stream right now. If you are not on my email list, and you want to come to tonight, you need to uh, be on my email list, bwmakingmoney.com. If you're already on my email list, you received the Zoom link about an hour ago. If you get on my email list now, the Zoom link is going to go out again at 545. So just check your emails, okay? bwmakingmoney.com. I look forward to seeing everybody this evening. Take care, ladies.